Hello, today we are continuing in our GCSE Physics Revision series, starting a new subject, looking at waves. If I can just remind you of what you've probably learned in maths, that if you take a right angle triangle, and we call this angle the angle alpha, then this side is called the opposite because it's opposite to alpha, this is called the adjacent because it's adjacent to alpha, and this is called the hypotenuse. And you've probably learned that the sine of the angle alpha is the opposite over the hypotenuse, and the cosine of the angle alpha is the adjacent over the hypotenuse. What that means is that for any given angle in a right angle triangle, the relationship of the opposite to the hypotenuse is a fixed amount for any given angle. So what we now do is to plot what's called a sine wave. So we're actually plotting sine alpha, sine alpha against alpha. So sine of the angle against the angle. And I will pick out some key angles, naught, 90, that's a right angle, 180, 270, and 360, and there are 360 degrees in a full cycle or circle. The sine of zero is zero. The sine of 90 is plus one. The sine of 180 is zero. The sine of 270 is minus one, so this is obviously minus one, and this here was plus one. The sine of 360 is zero, and then it starts all over again. So the graph of sine looks like this, which as you can see is a kind of wave, and then it just continues and repeats. So that's just plotting the sine of an angle against the angle itself. That is called a sine wave. You can also plot, if you choose to do so, a cosine wave, where you've got cosine alpha against alpha, but this time it will be precisely the opposite. If this is, these are the angles. For naught degrees, it's one. For 90 degrees, the cosine is zero. For 180 degrees, the cosine is minus one. For 270 degrees, the cosine is zero. And 360 degrees, it's one. So the cosine wave is in a sense precisely the opposite of the sine wave. If you look, when the sine wave is zero, the cosine wave is at its maximum. When the sine wave's at its maximum, the cosine wave is zero. But both of them are waves. Why did I do all that? because waves are critically important in physics. They crop up all over the place. So let's understand something about moving waves. Moving waves are a bit like the waves on the sea. In other words, they roll towards the shore. So here are my waves. And they continue. And they're traveling in this direction. So the whole wave is moving along. Now we need to know what we are going to call certain things. I'm just going to continue the wave down a little bit like that. The top of the wave is called the peak or the crest. The bottom of the wave is called a trough. The height of the wave, or the maximum height of the wave from its mean position is called the amplitude. It is not the distance between the top and the bottom, between the peak and the trough. The amplitude is from the mean position to the maximum position. That is the amplitude. The distance between two consecutive peaks, or if you like, two consecutive troughs, because it amounts to the same thing, is called the wavelength and is given the Greek letter lambda. The number of waves which pass a fixed point, so if I keep this fixed and watch as the waves go past, the number of complete waves, which means the distance from one wave at one peak to the next. The number of peaks that go past, if you like, the number of complete waves that go past in one second is called the frequency. 
So the frequency is measured in cycles per second or waves per second, or we use the term Hertz. And the time taken for just one wave to pass a particular point, in other words, for this peak to get to that point, so one wave has gone past this point here, the time taken for one wave to go past is called the period of the wave, and the period and the frequency are related by saying that the period is one over F, or it works the other way around, F is equal to one over T. And finally, if the wave is traveling at a velocity V in this direction, then you can say that the velocity V is equal to the wavelength times the frequency. So let's do an exam question. In the UK, there is a radio station called BBC Radio 2, and it broadcasts on 88 to 91 FM, which is another way of saying if it's 88 to 91 FM, FM stands for frequency modulated, that is also the same as 88 to 91 megahertz. And mega, of course, means uh, a million. You need to remember that K, K hertz would be a thousand hertz, M hertz would be megahertz, that's a million hertz, and we shall even get to G hertz, gigahertz, which is a billion, 1,000 million hertz, 1,000 million cycles per second. And I can tell you that radio waves travel at a speed C, which is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And the particular channel that I'm listening to broadcasts at 90 megahertz, so it's in this range. And I want to know what is the wavelength of the radio wave that is delivering my BBC Radio 2. So I simply take the formula that says that the velocity of a wave is equal to its wavelength times its frequency, that's what we just uh, said, and you can rearrange that to say that the wavelength is the speed of the wave divided by the frequency, which is going to be 3 times 10 to the 8th divided by the frequency, which is 90 times 10 to the 6th, because 10 to the 6th is 1 million, and if you divide that through with your calculator, you'll find that's essentially 300 divided by 90, which is 3.300 divided by 90, which is 3.33 meters. So the wavelength, the distance between two consecutive peaks of the signal that is delivering my radio program in the morning is 3.33 meters. Here's another exam question. I'm standing in the sea. As the waves of the sea, the waves roll past me, they're traveling in this direction, and I want to know what their velocity is. I can tell you that the wavelength of the waves is one meter, that is to say the distance between two consecutive peaks is one meter, and I can tell you that the time it takes for one wave to get to the other position, or one, for um, one wave to complete its cycle, so for this wave to get to that point, is two seconds. So that's the period of the wave. What then is the velocity? Well, the first thing we need to remember is that the frequency is one over the period. So that's going to be one over two because the period is two seconds. So the frequency is half a cycle per second. And now the velocity of the wave is just the wavelength times the frequency. The wavelength I told you was one meter. The frequency we just calculated is 0.5 or a half. So that's going to be 0.5 meters per second. So the speed of the waves as they go past me is 0.5 meters per second. You need to know about two different types of wave. There is the so-called transverse wave, which is what we've been kind of looking at so far. And that is where the waves travel in this direction but each individual element of the wave simply oscillates up and down. So this is going up and down, this is going down and up, this is going up and down, this is going down and up, and so on. So essentially what's happening is that if you look at different parts of the wave, they are just oscillating up and down in this kind of way. 
if this were a rope. The rope itself doesn't move, but the waves on the rope appear to move. But in fact, each if you tied a ribbon to the rope here, you would just see that ribbon going up and down. If you put a cork on the sea, even though the waves are flowing in this direction, if you put a cork, all you would see is that cork would just bob up and down. The waves appear to be moving in this direction, but the actual elements of the wave uh, move up and down. This moving up and down is called a transverse wave. You get that when you make waves in a rope, you get that when you get waves on the sea, and indeed light, which is made out of waves and radio waves, such as BBC Radio 2, are all transverse waves. Sound waves, however, are longitudinal waves. What that means is that when you make a noise, you essentially create oscillations in the air. And those oscillations don't go up and down, but they go from side to side. So what you effectively do is you create parts of the air where the molecules are spread out, and that's called rarefied or rarefaction. And then other areas where the molecules are very close together, and that's called a compression. And these just go rarefaction, compression, rarefaction, compression. And they are constantly changing because they are themselves just going backwards and forwards so that what was a rarefaction will in half a wavelength's time become a compression and then a half a wavelength later it will be a rarefaction again. So these are just oscillating and these are just oscillating and the wavelength of course is the distance between two successive compressions or the centres, the, 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 the most compressed part of the compression is one wavelength. Exactly the same principle applies that the velocity of a wave is equal to, sorry, is equal to the wavelength times the frequency. We know what the wavelength is. The frequency is the number of times per second that this wave goes from compression to rarefaction and back to compression. That's one wave. Compression, rarefa rarefaction, compression is one cycle. How many cycles per second? That's the frequency. So if I tell you that sound travels at 340 meters per second, and that middle C on a piano has a frequency of 256 hertz, so if you sing middle C, that would be 256 hertz, I want to know what is the wavelength of that sound? Well, once again, I take V equals lambda F, I can rearrange that to say that lambda is equal to V divided by F. And that's going to be 340 because that's the velocity divided by the frequency, which is 256. And that's very roughly 1.33 meters. So the distance between two consecutive compressions of the air is 1.33 meters when you play a pure middle C. Now I want to look at five properties of waves. The properties are reflection, refraction, diffraction, interference, and polarization. In the remainder of this video, we're going to look at reflection. Then in the next video, we'll look at refraction. And in the video after that, we'll look at diffraction, interference, and polarization. So reflection simply means that light, if that's a surface, light hitting a surface is reflected from it. You could think of it as rather like a ball bouncing off of a surface, but as we shall possibly see a bit later on, that's not too good. It suffice it to say that, that light, or indeed waves, um, reflect from surfaces. Now it depends what the surface is like, and that determines how well the, the waves reflect. For example, if this is a sheet of paper and the light is coming from the light in my room or even the light from the sun, the paper is pretty rough and uneven. It may not look it, but at the microscopic level it is. And consequently, light will just be reflected in all directions, which is just as well because that's how you can see it. 
you can only see a piece of paper because it is illuminated by the light, either artificial light in your room or light from the sun. And the light reflects in all directions, and that's why you can see the piece of paper. But there are certain things that reflect light very much more precisely, and we call those mirrors. This is the dull side of the mirror, which I'm shading here, so nothing's going to happen there. But if I shine a ray of light from a lamp in this direction onto a mirror, what you need to do is to construct what's called the normal, which is an imaginary line, it doesn't exist, but we construct it at 90 degrees to the surface of the mirror. And it hits the mirror at the same point that the incident ray, we call this the incident ray, then what you can say is that that ray will be reflected, and that is now the reflected ray, but here's the point, the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. Those two angles are the same. So this is an incident ray, it has an angle of incidence. This is a reflected ray, it has an angle of reflection, and the incident ray equals the reflected ray for reflection from something like a mirror. Please note that the angles are always measured between the incident ray or the reflected ray and the normal. They are never, never, never measured between the rays and the mirrors. That is wrong. Always between the normal. If you look in a mirror, you will see yourself and your reflection will have a particular property. Firstly, it will be the same size as you. There isn't any magnification. Secondly, it will be as far behind the mirror, or it appears to be as far behind the mirror, as you are in front. If you move away, the image will move away. Thirdly, it will be the same way up. In other words, you won't appear upside down. Both the it object, that's you, and the image are the same way up. But if you look carefully, you'll notice that your right arm has become your image's left arm. In other words, laterally you have been inverted. You're the same way up, but you've been um, changed so that right arms become left arms and left arms become right arms. So we summarise all that by saying that the image is the same distance behind the mirror as the object is in front. The image is what we call virtual, because it's actually behind the mirror, it doesn't really exist. It's upright, it's the same way up, but it's laterally inverted because right arms become left arms and vice versa. You need to know how to draw a ray diagram. If this is the mirror, and this is the object, this is a real object. This is the image of that object, which of course is going to appear on the other side of the mirror as far behind as the, uh, as the object is in front. And let us suppose that you are looking, this is your eye, you are looking at the mirror in that way. What is light actually doing? Well, the best way of drawing this is to draw a ray from the top of your eye to the top of the image. So for that I probably need a ruler so I get it reasonably accurate. I usually do freehand but here I think I better do something a little bit more precise and having said that I messed it up but nonetheless there you are. That is a ray from the top of my eye to the top of the image. Of course what actually happens is that the ray is really coming from the top of the object there is a normal, those two angles are the same because the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. So what is actually happening is that the ray is hitting the mirror and coming into my eye and I perceive it as being here because that's, that's where it looks as though the light has come from. It's actually been reflected but it looks as though it's coming from here. Let's draw another ray from the top of the image to the bottom of my eye. All of this light is going to go into my eye and be focused. And once again, what is actually happening is that light from the top of the object is hitting the mirror 
and reflecting into my eye. And once again, of course, there will be a normal at this point. And again, the angle of incidence will equal the angle of reflection when the ray hits the mirror. For completeness, of course, I should also draw the rays that come from the bottom of the image, which will go like this. But of course, they don't, they don't truly come from the image because there is no such thing as the image. They're actually coming from the object and they're being reflected off of the mirror into my eye. So the true path is this one and this one, but my eye perceives that it's come from the image because that's what it looks like. It looks as though it's come from here. Whereas in fact, what the light has done in all cases is hit the mirror and be reflected, but it gives the impression or the image that the actual image is behind the mirror. And that's the way to draw ray diagrams for showing how light is reflected into your eye, giving the illusion, the impression, the image, that there is an image behind the mirror. Of course, light will be coming from all parts of the object and reflecting off of the mirror into my eye, but it is usually sufficient to, to just draw the rays that come from the top and the rays that come from the bottom to give the impression of what's actually happening. The fact that the rays are going into different parts of my eye doesn't matter because, of course, my eye has got a lens. We'll be coming onto lenses later, but that lens will simply focus all of these rays to one point so that I get a well-focused impression of the image that I am viewing. And finally, here is just one example of the way in which um, I can use mirrors. Suppose I have a very tall wall that I can't see through, and I don't have a step ladder. I'm standing here, and I want to see what's going on out here. Maybe there's a ship sailing on the sea that I want to see then what I can do is to construct a thing called a periscope, which looks something like this. I have two mirrors and they are at 45 degrees. And what happens then is that light will shine in. Let's use a red pen for the light. Here comes the light. It will reflect. And of course it will reflect straight down. It will hit that mirror it will reflect again along here and into my eye. And so I can't see through the wall, but light has been effectively reflected so that I can see over the wall. The reason that the light reflects the way it does is that you know we always have to draw a normal. The normal is always right angles to the surface of the mirror. The angle of incidence always equals the angle of reflection. And if you've got these mirrors at 45 degrees, then the incident angle will be 45 degrees, the reflected angle will be 45 degrees, so the total angle will be a right angle. And that's why something that's going from left to right now goes straight down, and the reason why something going straight down now goes from left to right.